Good morning. It's an honor to be here at Sugarland Baptist. I have heard so many things about this church over the years, so many positive comments about the congregation here in this place. And while it's an honor to be here, I also come recognizing the circumstances under which you have a guest preacher this morning. I want you to know on behalf of Truett Seminary that first we have had a close relationship with Sugarland Baptist in general and Phil Leinberger in particular for many years. So I want to express to you that we at Truett have been grieving with you and we have been praying for you. And I'd like to start this morning with, with a word of prayer. Would you join me as we pray together? God of grace, God of mercy, I pray this morning for your ongoing presence to be felt by all who are in this place. Bind together through your spirit this church. Bless them through your ministry of consolation and grant to us all the reminder of your promise of hope for restoration by you now and especially with one another and to you in the resurrection to come. And as we enter into this time of proclamation, I pray that as my words are true to your word, they may be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, they may be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, you may think you've never been in a situation quite like it. Maybe some of you have had this kind of uh, event take place when you're out on the lake on a weekend. I don't know. But the, the scene depicted here in the Gospel of Matthew might seem unfamiliar to most of our experiences. The disciples are out on a boat for most of the night, and, and then suddenly in the blackness, in, in the pre-dawn blackness, somewhere between 3, three and 6 a.m., the winds begin to pick up, whips in their faces. If they were asleep before, they're not anymore. They try to make their way to the other side, but they're getting nowhere fast. White caps come crashing over the boat, splashing water on the deck. Sails are useless. Rudder won't respond. They're getting seasick. And you thought you couldn't relate to this biblical story. You have just tried to mind your own business, and in some of your best moment, mind some of God's. You didn't choose the white water that has become your life, but the storms have picked up anyway in your marriage, in your family, in your job, at school, and at church. All we wanted was the calm and quiet seas. All we wanted was smooth sailing. Now, as a church historian, I, I can't help myself but to bring up something about how churches used to be designed, their architecture. If you've ever been inside a Gothic church, maybe in Europe or a replica here in the United States, you might notice when you walk into the church this giant archway that runs from the back of the church all the way to the front, to the chancel, the archway that runs down the center aisle of the church. And you might know that the term for that is nave. We get the word navy from it. And so if you look at that giant ceiling, that arch above you, it looks like the hull of a ship turned upside down. For a ship is indeed a symbol of early Christianity. And sometimes churches, congregations can be tossed and turned by the events of life. And if we had to admit it, we want to be in control of the vessel on which we journey, captain of our own fate and all of that. But sometimes the wind just begins to howl around us and we know that we can't control it. Now, I want you to notice that this story here in the Gospel of Matthew is not like that other story of the sea from the Old Testament. You know that story with the runaway prophet and the giant fish. That's a favorite of many children. But that story is not the same as this one. 
The disciples do not have some secret, unconfessed sins stored up in the hull of their ship. They're not trying to escape from God. And it seems that God is not after them for any particular reason. But the storms have picked up anyway. And that's just the way life is sometimes. Your kids may not have messed up. Your spouse may have always kept his vows. Your business has always stayed in the black. Your health has always been good. And then all of a sudden, something happens. And our first reaction is to beat ourselves up. I cannot tell you how many people have come to visit me over the years when some cataclysmic event has happened in their lives and they ask me why this event happened at all. And ultimately the question arises, is God trying to punish me? And to be quite honest, I don't think that it's beyond God today to try to reach someone through calamity. He does in the Old Testament. But the reality is, Much of the time, white water just happens. Sometimes, like the Allstate commercials, mayhem just shows up. And the Christian faith is not so much an explanation of all bad as it is salvation by a God all good. As Charles Dufoucault wrote, difficulties are not the passing condition that we must allow to blow over like a storm so that we can set back to work when the calm returns. They are the normal condition. And so God enters the scene through Jesus. And isn't that the way it often goes? God comes into our stormy situations and and we don't recognize him. But our lives are daily comprised of God's everyday miracles, miracles that we are blind to. As for the disciples, they have enough culture-driven superstition built up in them that they take Jesus for a ghost. As for us, we mistake God's help for so many other things. Good luck, self-deserved fortune, the normal working out of things, but we always mistake God for something else. And maybe our biggest problem is that we have enough empirical science built up in our society, a way of explaining away the divine, that we mistake and we dismiss God's presence too. I mean, just look at how we treat this story and others like it. We, we tell jokes about them. Like there's the one about the three preachers who were fishing out in a boat. All of a sudden, two of them step right out of the boat onto the water, and they walk on the surface of the water until they get to the shore. So the third guy steps out of the boat, and sure enough, he sinks immediately into the water. And so one preacher says to the other, you think we should tell them where the rocks are? Or there's the story about the boy who comes home from church. His mother asked him what he learned in Sunday school, and he tells her about Moses leading the Israeli troops using the latest surface-to-air missiles against the Egyptians. She says, are you telling me the truth? And he said, no, but if I told you what my teacher said happened, you'd never believe me. (laughs) So we don't know what to make of these miracles in the Bible sometimes, so we, we tell these same jokes over and over, or we try to explain them away using our best ways to fit them into our view and experience of the world. And so there are some people who say that the waters didn't really part in Cecil DeMille fashion. Some scholars instead come in and say that, you know, the shallow Reed Sea had some water blow on it just so, and it moved over a little bit during that moment. Or, or Jesus didn't really multiply the loaves and fishes, but he, he opened people's hearts to share the food that they had brought with them, that they had tucked away in their, cl- their cloaks or Or maybe Peter had done a head count during Jesus' sermon and he sent out for 5,000 box lunches to go. Famous commentator William Barclay says about this story of Jesus walking on the water that Jesus was really on the edge of the shore. Since the Greek phrase epithelosin can mean either on the water or, or toward the water, it could mean that, the, wa- that the, the winds had driven the boat to the northern shore of the lake, and Jesus 
seeing his disciples struggling in the moonlight, came walking on the surf of the shore, and the disciples, who were so startled by this, they were terrified, and they thought that Jesus was, was walking on the water. Or there's even the more fanciful attempt by the 18th century theologian Carl Friedrich Bard, who suggested that it's possible that maybe there was some timber near the shore, and, and Jesus stepped on it, and he found that it, it bore his weight, and so he, he approached the boat on or, uh, in it, and he clambered in besides the disciples, and the disciples, who never see things clearly anyway, always thought more was happening than actually was. They passed on for posterity's sake that Jesus was actually walking on the water rather than the cedar wood. We struggle to believe in miracles, so we either make jokes about them or we try to explain them away rationally, and in so doing, we try to fit them into the world as we know it. But the explanations we contrive are often more ludicrous than the miracles themselves. And so, when life does get turbulent, we, we try to explain it away. Or we wonder why God if he's really out there, would let this bad thing happen to me, happen to us. I mean, we go to church. Many of us even tithe. Why us? Why do we feel so alone? The disciples felt quite alone too. Jesus was not with them. He had gone to shore for an all-night quiet time in prayer and that's the way we often feel. Jesus is way back in the first century, we think, and, and if only we lived in Bible times, but we can't go back. We're far too removed from them. We can't reach them. So all we have are these old stories about miracles, which are hard to believe in our society today. So we can't reach Jesus now. He's somewhere else. He is removed from us, we think. But friends, hear this, for this is the gospel. We don't have to reach Jesus because Jesus comes instead to us. He comes walking on the white water of our own lives. People in ancient times believed that water represented chaos and evil, and these always had more power than human beings in the struggle of life and death. Whether you look at the literature of Greek and Roman mythology or at Near Eastern religions, you'll see the same thing. Chaos can only be overcome by the gods, they thought. This is why for centuries people were frightened to explore the ocean. And when Jesus comes walking on the water, that is what we are to understand. Job 9.8 tells us that God alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. God who created those waters is the God of those waters. And the disciples, of course, are not considering that theological idea at the time. At first, frightened at this apparent apparition, Jesus cries out to them in their fear, It is I! And what we often miss in our English translation is that Jesus here is actually uttering the personal name of God. I am Yahweh. And here the disciples would have immediately associated his words with the God who spoke those same words to Moses at the burning bush, who delivered Israel through the Red Sea, who provided them a promised land. This ambiguous phrase, George Mason tells us, actually means I am the being of beings. I am before and after all that is. I am who I am, and I will be whom I will be, and I am the one you can count on. And Jesus will be the very presence of that very God. And Jesus had just returned from praying to that source of all being, that God of order, that Father of creation. And he shows us that God is not content to be all-powerful at a distance. 
But God comes into the very white water lives that we have through the concrete human life of Jesus Christ. He comes to give us firm footing in a world at sea. And so the only way for us to find security is in relationship with him. And then there's Peter. Peter, who is at least the most outspoken of the disciples, we also might use words like bold and presumptuous. Peter has this interesting request as the disciples begin to wipe the water from their eyes and focus in on Jesus' more familiar features. Jesus, here's Peter. Peter says to him, Lord, if it actually is you, tell me to come out to you on the water. Now, I don't know about you, but I think Peter is one of those different personalities, right? I mean, that's what I find so convincing about the gospel accounts is it shows that the disciples were different from one another, and Peter is just an interesting character. I mean, if I think if I were one of the disciples, I would still be sitting around quietly gazing, looking at the other disciples for reassurance. He, he's not a ghost. But Peter, Peter's ready to leap out of the boat and do things which only Jesus heretofore has done. And Jesus bids him to come, and Peter then rides above the waves, if only for a few moments. He lives above his circumstances for this fleeting time, and he gets a glimpse of what is possible for human beings that one could never guess. And then all of a sudden, he begins to look around himself. He sees the wind and the surf, and he thinks to himself, what am I doing up here? A man can't walk on water. I'm going to drown. The elements are all against me. I can't make it. And when those thoughts came, he began to live up to the name that Jesus would later give him, the rock, because he began to sink like one. The gravity of his heart was a weight more than that which could defy the laws of gravity. And even as we encounter God for the first time during a crisis, we might pray and ask God to help us to rise above our circumstances. But if you're like me, even before we have finished saying our amens, we've already begun to focus again on our problems and think about ourselves in light of them. How could we ever think that we could live through these things? And so we begin to sink again under the gravity of our grief, our anxiety, and our human concerns. And like Peter when we take our eyes off of Jesus and focus again on the chaos around us, we stop floating and we begin drowning. You of little faith, Jesus says, why do you doubt? Those words, I think, must have been as disturbing to Peter as they are to us. But I like what Charles Spurgeon wrote at this point. He says, Peter was nearer his Lord when he was sinking than when he was walking. Let me say that again. Peter was nearer his Lord when he was sinking than when he was walking. Because it was when Peter was in trouble that he was driven to Jesus. That's when he was closest to him. And I know that some people want to make everything that bad happens into the world as some punishment from God, but I don't think that's right. For in everyone's life, trouble does indeed come. And so while we shouldn't necessarily start figuring out what we've done in some troublesome time, we should instead begin by turning to God. And it's only when difficulties arise, when storms begin to stir, that we're confronted by our own lack of ability and weakness, and we are driven to Jesus simply because we have nowhere else to turn. Henry Ward Beecher once wrote that troubles are often the tools by which God fashions us for better things. It is only during our sinking moments that we can be reminded that all things are possible with God. 
And it is only during difficulties that we can see that the problem with miracles is not that they don't happen, but it's that they do. They just happen differently than we might expect them. But only after a chapter of our lives has been completed, perhaps only after we turn the last page on our earthly lives, can we look back and see God's fingerprints throughout even at the most dark chapters of those lives. And Jesus reaches out, and he lifts us up. And so the great gospel message is not to have self-confidence and to lift yourself up. Instead, the great irony is that we can go on believing even while we're sinking, because faith is not a human achievement to begin with. Faith is the gift of God. And just as Jesus came walking on the water towards his disciples in the storm, he brings us faith too. And we learn that the most decisive act of faith is not when we, like Peter, try to initiate faith in God by daring to do something spectacular. I mean, Americans believe we can do anything if we try hard enough especially when we're proactive. But we learn that it is not for us to initiate faith. It's simply for us to respond in faith. The confession of faith in this story is the simple cry, Lord, save me. We learn that the answers to our troubles are not reserved in ourselves or in others, or in the latest surefire how-to book on the market, the answers are in Christ. And sometimes they're less answers than just ways of being. Sometimes it's just being still and trusting. Trusting and keeping our eyes on Christ, our only security in this whitewater world is the grab of God. Our relationship with Jesus Christ in which we are grasped despite our doubts, raised from our sunkenness, is our only security. And it is not that Peter did not believe in Jesus. It's simply that he took his eyes off of him. That's the kind of doubt that he had. And we all of us have doubts. We all of us lay awake some restless nights where we wake in a cold sweat wondering whether we're just kidding ourselves, whether there really is a God out there who loves us enough not to let us drown in the abyss. And like Peter, every Christian, if we're honest with ourselves, lives in a constant state of faith and unfaith. We need to be saved moment after moment after moment. Not that we fall out of relationship with Christ, but we have to relearn to trust him time and time and time again. Only then do we recognize the miracle of faith. The real miracle in life is that God does not stand on the sidelines of heaven to be all-powerful at a distance to watch as the play unfolds. No, God is out there on the field with us. We just need the faith to see. Regardless of the outcome in this life, throughout the storm, God is there. He is who he is, and he will be whom he will be, and God will lift us up and love us and give us faith, but only in his timing and in his way. Now, I want to point out one last thing in our text this morning. And it's not the miracle of walking on the water, but it's the miracle that took place back in the boat. For our passage says, Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Did you know this is the very first time that Jesus is called the Son of God by his disciples? James Montgomery Boyce points out that this text builds on chapter 8 where they asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. 
And here they say, truly, Jesus, you are the Son of God, for God had given them enough faith to see it. This is also the first time the disciples were said to have worshipped Jesus. In chapter 2, the Magi came from the east to worship Jesus. A leper is said to have worshipped him later on, or the text says at least he knelt before him. A synagogue ruler is said to have done the same thing in chapter 9, but this is the first time the disciples worshipped. And it is important to note that their worship was conjoined to their confession, because that is what worship is, essentially. Throughout the storms, Peter took his eyes off Jesus, but now back in the boat, all the disciples have placed their complete focus on Christ. And so remember, next time you cry out to him in your desperate need, when you are tossed and you are turned by this life, remember when he does come to rescue you, when he comes alongside of you, to give him thanks, to worship him, and to say, truly, Jesus, you are the Son of God. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, forgive us for trying to steer the boat on our own. Forgive our doubts and our fears. But God, direct us through this stormy life Shelter us from harm, lift our spirits to be taken solely in you. Lord, we thank you for being our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. We pray in the meantime, you would give us faith for today. Through Christ, we pray these things. Amen.